But my question is, is that a form of a sin? I mean, not that I'm doubting the gospel. It's not been that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so skepticism is a, is a fine thing to have. And it's good to be skeptical. Um, Jesus encourages us to be shrewd as serpents, but innocent as doves, um, which is a good way to be about it. Serpents, serpents are known for being wise and crafty and clever. And so it's, it's good to be, you know, don't fall into scams and, and that kind of thing. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Uh, but when, when Malachi is talking about it, um, he's talking about people who are giving out of spite would probably be a better way to do it. And so we'll get into this. We're talking about the different kinds of, um, of offerings that they're giving. Um, and it's like, yeah, okay, so I have to do this. That, that kind of mentality. And that's that's more of what he's getting at than that what you're describing. Okay. Do we have any other off topic questions or are we gonna to get to the topic today? We're gonna to get to the topic today. Oh, yes. And possibly Finn and Rackers. <laughs> now that guy's a short book. That won't take us but a couple of weeks to go through it. And then I'll talk about something else. Stand right. They want to sing on Thanksgiving. Oh. We're not supposed to know that. Says who? Hmm? What does it mean? That's fair. It's, it's supposed to be a surprise. Is it? The Italian pop. <laughs> so briefly we talked about it towards the end of the lesson last week. Uh, but I think it's good to review it because we just kind of rushed through it. Very, very little is known about Malachi. Um, some prophets we know a whole great deal about. Right, or Haggai, or Isaiah, or Samuel. We're in their books. They give us very specific clues about, you know, or Amos. I was a fig dresser. Like we know, we know who these guys were beforehand, what they did, where they lived, who they talked to, and kind of what's going on in their world. For Malachi, all we know about Malachi are these four chapters. This is all that, that history has has to tell us. Um, apart from one huge detail, Malachi was the last prophet of the Old Testament. That's not true. Well. Is messy mm -hmm. Do you need me to wipe too? <laughs> nope, I have napkins. We're good. Right. Malachi was the last prophet of the Old Testament. How our Bible is divided. Um, John the Baptist is technically the last prophet of the Old Testament, but technicality there. Um, but after Malachi, let's just we're gonna, let's go to go to page here uh, 1020, 1022. Right. So John the Baptist prophesied before Jesus came on the scene? Yes. Right, so John the Baptist had a following when Jesus shows up there in the crowd one day to get baptized. Yeah. And he was, you know, <laughs> it had been a couple of weeks, but he was before Jesus. <laughs> um, but Malachi, page 1022, like, this is the last words of the Old Testament, and he will turn the hearts of their fathers to their children, and the hearts of their children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Thus ends the Bible. Like this was the last word of God for 400 <laughs> years. Um, 400 years. That's what after Malachi stops speaking, and then when Jesus shows up in, in Matthew. Um, so it is kind of a what's the word? Finality of, of the old covenant of the Old Testament. And so Malachi will talk a bit about that. Yes, go ahead. So. The Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible. Yep. And this, and there are no other books that came after this in the Hebrew Bible. No. So we can talk about that in a second. Take my cup to here first. Okay. Internet, I hope you're enjoying this. I wasn't expecting it to be pink. <laughs> I was expecting vanilla. I'm very happy with pink. So the, the Old Testament, according to the, like the, the Jewish Bible, is divided into, into three categories called the Tanakh, okay. for the word before maybe, mm -hmm. the Torah, the Ketuvim, and the Nevi'im. The Torah is the first five books of Moses, it's often called the Law. And then there's the, um, the Ketuvim, that's the writings, the stuff that's written down, that would be like the Psalms, um, Proverbs, that kind of stuff. And then there's the Nevi'im, which is the prophets. And so then we have books like... Uh, First and Second Samuel and Isaiah and, and these books, and so those have all been 
been put into a bunch. This is the the Old Testament, the Scriptures, the Bible. Um, and that has been largely untouched for a very, 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 very long time. And so, like, when archaeologists look at these things, so, like, at, um, lost my words, the Essenes, E-S-S-E-N-E-S, the Essenes, they lived in Israel um, a little bit before um, Jesus shows up, and then a little bit after Jesus shows up, they're there. They wrote a famous body of documents called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, perhaps you've heard of those before. Um, story of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, there is this, like, a, like a, when they were discovered, there was this shepherd kid who was out shepherding sheep, like 12 year old, you know, punk kid, for lack of a better word. And how you shepherd sheep in that part of the world, you take rocks, and if you want the sheep to go one way, you throw a rock at a bush, and the sheep will go the other way. And you want to throw a rock at the bush, and that's how you shepherd sheep. Um, and so shepherds are really good at throwing rocks. Like King David, when he took the rock and he threw it at Goliath, right? He's really good at throwing rocks. He thought one of his sheep had strayed into a cave. Um, so he picks up his rock to throw it into the cave to scare the sheep out. He throws it into the cave, doesn't scare the sheep out, but he hears broken pottery. Um, and so he goes in and checks it out, and wouldn't you know it, it's the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, so he takes it, to the, takes it to Jerusalem, which is like an hour's drive away, and uh, takes it to an archaeologist, a British archaeologist, and he's like, I found this. And the archaeologist is like, well, where did you find this? This is amazing. And so he, being the shrewd 12-year-old that he is, starts negotiating, and the archaeologist is like, okay, I'll pay you X amount of dollars per manuscript. And so the kid goes back to the cave, takes the manuscript, starts cutting it up into pieces, because the more pieces he has, the more money he makes. <laughs> he takes it back to the archaeologist, and the archaeologist is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't do that anymore. I will pay you more for greater instead greater intact square inches. And so the bigger the sheets are, proportionally I will give you more money for them. Um, and then they go and he said that causes him to go and just find the great collection that is the Dead Sea Scroll Dead wow. Sea Scroll documents. Um, what's significant about the Dead Sea Scrolls is that it contains a complete Old Testament. Um, it seems like the Essenes they had what was called the scriptorium. Uh, which is just a fancy place to say where you wrote stuff down where scribes work. <laughs> so they found a bunch of ink wells and a bunch of ink stuff and papyrus where they know. So like somebody, if we were to copy a book uh, before printing, what's the fastest way to do it? Well, it's to have one person read and like 12 people write it down. So I would be up here and I'd be reading things like, then those who feared the Lord spoke, and then those men you guys would write down and that kind of thing. And that's how books were copied in mass. And so in this... <laughs> As it gets stricter than that, Crazy. which we can talk about later, they count the letters to make sure they have, but it doesn't matter. And so they have this, these documents in this like, so if you were, let's say you were at a synagogue in Galilee and you needed a scroll for Isaiah, you'd put it on your order and send it down to the Essenes and say, I need a scroll of Isaiah. And they'd sit down, like, all right, we're doing a batch of Isaiah. So everybody would get together and write down Isaiah word for word as you're going through. Um, the Essenes were destroyed by the Romans because the Romans came through and just kind of, you know, knocked everybody out. Um, in the year 70 AD or so. And the Essenes were part of that getting knocked out. And so all of their scrolls that they had kept for their copying were stored, because it's God's word, tightly in you know, these, these clay jars with seals on them, put in the cave. Um, it's kind of like it's a library. But nobody came back to get them. And the uh, Romans didn't know that they were there, and the Romans didn't care. So they just sat there for literally thousands of years. And so then they, are, uh, they, they find them, they start looking at them, they start translating them. And so like, okay, so this is this is Psalms. They found a whole bunch of copies of Psalms, because Psalms is like a hymnal, right? It's the hymnal of the Old Testament. So we've got a bunch of hymnals. They had a bunch of hymnals. Um, and they found uh, the most significant piece was the whole book of Isaiah, called the Isaiah Scroll. And when they compared the Isaiah that they had to the Isaiah that we have, it's the same Isaiah. Oh. Um, it, was, it was supposed to be this big document to like expose how the Bible has changed over the years and that's what was being hyped up. Let's look at all the errors that have crept into the Bible from the, when the Essenes wrote this thousands of years ago to what we have now. Surely it's, it hasn't changed at all. A couple of maybe like spellings for like homonyms, like there, there, and there. Mm. If I'm going to say to you, okay, so this is their dog, maybe you, maybe you write down you know, T-H-E-I-R, maybe somebody else doesn't think you write T-H-E-R-E, like that kind of, that kind of mistake. Mm -hmm. um, so, were the Essenes <coughs> Jewish? They were. Okay. Yep. They were a sect. So they, they're like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, 
you see inside the Ford that we know about, they were probably born. Just like there's Lutherans and Catholics and Protestants and Methodists and, and whatever else, that kind of thing. Yeah. So where are the scrolls stored now? All over. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, there is a there is a Dead Sea Scroll Museum in Jerusalem where the bulk of them are. They're stored between special fancy glass that's been sealed with argon instead of air. That way, it, a pirate doesn't degrade it all. Um, you can go take a look at them. They don't use they don't use flash photography though because the flashes would damage the documents. That kind of thing. Anyway, moral of the story: the Bible that we have has been around for a long time, and so even those those years. So why these scenes matter is they show us that there was a collect Bible by the time of Jesus was there. We can go back even further to another book, which is called the Septuagint. Um, it's the Old Testament in Greek. Um, so when Jesus quotes, so the New Testament quotes the Bible, and like, God quotes his Bible. All right, so uh, Romans 8, uh, on page 1202. For your sake are being killed all the day long, your garden is sheep to be slaughtered. Um, if you go to the footnote for letter A, it says, that's Psalm 44. So let me go to Psalm 44. Let's jump now, Psalm 44. Great, thank you. So Psalm 44, verse 22. It says, yet for your sake we are killed all the day long, we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. You notice they're different? We have four instead of yet, are killed, being killed, those kinds of things. They're different. Should they not be the same? Is that just translation? It's because in the New Testament they're quoting the Septuagint, and they're not quoting the, not quoting the Hebrew. Um, and so that's the difference between Greek and Hebrew. It's not a significant difference, um, as you can see there, but it is where those differences come from. And so we have the Septuagint, which was clearly around at the time of Jesus, and that takes time to get put together. And so we know that the whole Bible was, Old Testament was sealed a long time ago, um, after Malachi. We have a whole book put together. So, other books are written, and there's some of them are in the Catholic Bible, like Maccabees, maybe you've heard of that one before. 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Maccabees, mm -hmm. or Esdras, Tobit, additions to Daniel, additions to Esther, um, the testimony of the 12 patriarchs, the and Proverbs promise. of Moses. Um, Is that a promise? That's a New Testament one. Oh, okay. um, There's a bunch more Old Testament ones that are out there. Okay. Um, they've been around for a long time. People have always known about them, scholars and, and things like that. But they've just never been quite scripture. Um, so we don't put them. If you have a book that says Holy Bible on it, you want it to be the stuff that's for sure part of the Bible. Um, and so other books we just, we just don't put in. Um, things like Thomas. Thomas is uh, fan fiction. would be the best way to describe it. Somebody wrote the book of Thomas down with the name Thomas on it, so that way they get more street cred. <laughs> People would want to go and buy the book. Uh, but it's never been considered to be anything important. Is it in the Catholic faith? No. Oh, okay. No. Okay. So like, um, the Gospels have always been found together, archaeologically speaking. And then the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to the point they've always been refer referred to as the fourfold Gospel. That's how the church fathers talked about it, like way back in the 200s, in the 100s, the 300s. It's the fourfold gospel, the fourfold gospel. So they've always known about there's only been four gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, so other books added, like Thomas, or what was the other one? Peter. Um, no, it's not a, it's not a thing. Was there actually a book <coughs> of Mary? No. There was a. The Gospel of Mary, they, they, somebody drew up a bunch of like uh, hype over it. We found the Gospel of Jesus' wife or something like that, which is sometimes called the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Are you thinking of his mom? No, okay, well, that's something the different then. But no, it's just, they're not, they're not things. The end fan fiction, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, it's fan fiction. 
something to be skeptical about. Yeah. <laughs> the words that are in here are very intentionally in here, um, and we can be very confident these are the words that God wants us to know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cool. Malachi. Shall we read it? Talk about it? Any other background questions? Let's read chapter 1. If somebody would read verses 1 through 7, then somebody read 8 through 14. Then I can eat my cupcake. The oracle of the word, <coughs> excuse me, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Um, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? It is not Esau, Jacob's brother, uh, declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste to his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says. They may build, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country. Uh, the people with whom the Lord is angry is angry forever. Uh, your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar, but you say, how have we polluted, uh, polluted you, saying the Lord, saying that the Lord's table may be despised. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Somebody else read verse 8 to the end of the chapter. And you offer blood animals and sacrifice, is that not evil? And when, and when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present, present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God, that he may be gracious to us. Will such a gift come in your hand? Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among, all, among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name, and a true offering for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. We need to go on. Yep, we got like two more verses here. Okay, but you profane it when you say the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, that is its fruit may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick. And this is, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the sheep who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices his Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Great, thank you so much. Lots of stuff going on here, but no images of like three headed dogs. So there's a little bit easier for us. Pretty 
a little more straightforward to understand what's going on. So let's talk about it. What's going on? Talk about the type of sacrifices given to him. Yeah. Yeah. He's mad about the sacrifices that are given to him. Absolutely. What's making him mad? The quality of the sacrifices? Yeah, the quality of the sacrifices. Yeah, absolutely. That's what's going on. Um, well, let's, let's, let's end that. First here, though, um, starting back here in, in the first part of chapter 1, we have this issue with Esau and Edom and Jacob and that kind of stuff. Um, any idea what's going on there? <coughs> He's saying, you know, I, I chose uh, Jacob, the land yeah. of Jacob. Yeah, I chose Jacob over Esau. I chose you, but you're doing this Yeah. Do you remember, you remember the story of Jacob and Esau? <coughs> yes. Um. Yeah. Okay. Esau got took the place of Jacob and put uh, hair on it. Backwards. Or Jacob did that. Took the place of Esau. All right. Yeah. So Esau, uh, his name just means red. I don't know if you ever know a guy. His name they call him Red. I've got a friend they call Red. I've never been called Red. Uh, believe it or not. Uh, but I got a friend. His name's Kevin. They call him Red. Um, Do you know my assessment? My age? Well, it seems unlikely. <laughs> he's a pastor in Iowa now. He's had a baby. No, my Very sweet. Kevin, and he's a redhead. They call him Red? Yeah. Big farmer, good Iowa farm boy. Great guy. Um, anyway, so Esau is, is this big, outdoorsy guy. He's big, he's, he's a large person, he, he's fit, he loves to be doing gamesy kinds of things. He hunts. I don't know if he fishes this kind of the desert. If he could fish, he would fish. Uh, he traps. He likes to be out there. Uh, and so he's, he's doing that thing. And Jacob, his brother, is more like the exact opposite. He's kind of scrawny, loves to stay inside, and then do more of the, uh, the tasks that would have been assigned to women in those days. Uh, cooking and cleaning and, and those kinds of things, which is a scandalous thing for a son to want to do. Uh, to hang out with the mom and do that, that kind of stuff, as opposed to what uh, a more appropriate thing like Esau would be doing. So Jacob and Esau are twins, um, and apparently they hated each other even before birth because they fought each other inside their mother's womb. Um, and so we read about this, and I don't know what that would look like to have these <laughs> reborn babies <laughs> punching at each other as they're chicken at each other inside mom's tummy there. Um, but so they, were, they were fighting so much to the point about who was going to be born first that the Bible includes the detail that Esau was born Jacob's hand grasping his leg as he was trying to keep him from getting out so he could have been born first. Uh, and so Jacob's Jacob's name is more, I don't know why it's called it, it's, it's like Benzeber is a good way to, a good way to kind of think of Jacob's name. He's, he's super clever. And so Esau is portrayed as being this like brute and Jacob, he's the He's the scar of the family, right? So we have Mufasa and Scar, right? <laughs> right? And so, yeah, that's a good, that's actually a good analogy. I don't know about that one. Gotta remember that one. Gotta remember that one, though. Yeah, because you know the Lion King is. Um, yeah, and so uh, Jacob plots with his mother to steal everything from his brother. And so one day Esau comes home and he's super hungry. He's been out, you know, hunting somewhere. He's like, I'm so, I'm so famished. Yeah, Jacob's like, I got some soup here that I'm cooking. It's like, oh, it smells so good. He's like, I'll give you a bowl of soup if you uh, give me your birthright. Uh, so birthright is all, so everything that the, the, the father has goes to the firstborn son. And Esau traded it for a bowl of soup. Right. Then um, later on, uh, when, when their dad is near, is near death, uh, Isaac is the dad's name. And Isaac is near death. So Abraham, Isaac. Right? Um, so when Isaac is near death, he calls, he calls his sons in because he wants to bless them. And because they, are, they speak with God, they're prophets, and so their blessings hold to be true um, in a way that our blessings seem different than our ways. Uh, and so he wants to bless his firstborn son. Um, and so this is where Jacob gets all sneaky. Jacob and his mom go and they, they kill a goat and they put the hair on his arms, that way he won't smell like it. He has him wear, he puts on Esau's clothes so he smells like being outside. His mom prepares the food so it tastes gamey. 
Thank you, thank you. Uh, Esau just hunted it. And so Esau is out hunting to prepare a last meal for his dad. Jacob is very sneakily deceiving his dad to give him the blessing. And Isaac's trying to figure out what's going on. He can't see it very well. He's old and he's dying. And so hey, you all sound like Jacob. You sure you're not Jacob? Come in, come here, give me a give me a kiss. And so he goes to kiss his dad, and his dad feels his arm, and it's furry, like a goat, which is somehow how Esau would have felt, just to keep an idea of Esau. Feels like a goat. Uh, he smells like the outside with the clothes on. He's like, you know, I thought you were Jacob, but you know, I touched you and you feel like Esau and you smell like Esau, so I'm gonna give you my blessing. And so he blesses him. So now he's stolen the inheritance, the birthright. He stole all of his stuff. And Esau comes in, and he is, as you can imagine, a grouch. Um, after having everything stolen from him by his younger brother. Uh, then through a series of events, we see this play out, where Jacob becomes, it's renamed to Israel, and he goes off and does some things. And then Esau, he also goes out, because he doesn't have a land anymore, because that was given to his brother. He doesn't have a blessing anymore, because that was given to his brother. And so he goes, and they settle just south of the promised land. So just south of Cain is this place called Edom, and they become the Edomites, which are like the bad guys of the Bible. So there's the Philistines, which are the bad guys, and the Edomites, which are the bad guys. I like the hyenas and lions there. Sure, we'll go with that. Um, and so this is uh, this is what, what God's saying here. Didn't I choose Jacob? Right? I, I intentionally chose. What do you mean I don't love you guys? I chose Jacob. I should, dead right, should have taken Esau. He was the first one, but I chose Jacob instead. And now Esau and his family, are, are, they, they're cursed. We've fought wars against them every time I've conquered them for you guys. Um, they've destroyed, they're, they're like, I'm going to be over my city. And I'm like, oh no, you're not. And we go and we destroy it down again. Because this, is, this isn't this is what the family we're supposed to follow. We're supposed to follow Jacob. We're supposed to follow, we're supposed to follow me. He says, I will tear down their wicked country. Um, and your own eyes will see this. That great is the Lord even beyond the borders of Israel. That God is remaining faithful to his chosen servant, to the Israelites. Um, God changes the name Jacob to Israel later on. The word Israel, uh, so when he met wrestles with the angel all night, remember that story. Anyway, so that's what's going on here. So, he's, so this is this is a rebuke of God to the Israelites, right? And so the Jews now. This is after the exile. They're in Jerusalem. This is the last book of the Old Testament, so we know it's post when they rebuilt the temple, and and the people are like still lamenting that you know God has rejected them, and God comes through Malachi and says, no. I didn't reject you. Right? I chose you. I specifically chose you to be my people because I want to bring salvation through your lineage, through your descendants. Um, what do you mean I don't love you? And then God takes away that excuse, and now he's just going to like, as the news would say, blast the Israelites with this, with this language here. Uh, God throws down a smackdown. Beat going on here. Then he's like, you know, even, even a son honors his dad, right? And, and a servant honors his master. This is how it works among you. Your kids don't rebel against you, and if you start working for somebody, you honor and respect them. Why do I get treated worse than they do? Right? That's a very fair question. I'm God. <laughs> Significantly higher up on the pecking order than a master or even, even a father. I'm, I am God. And then you're like, how would we despise you? So this is God now having this rhetorical conversation with the priest. Um, saying, God's calling them out for being dumb. And he's even trying to give their answers and then rebuff, rebuff them. So they'd have no leg to stand on. Um, no covering for their, for their wickedness. Because what was going on is they were um, contempt. Was that, was that the word? No, you had a different word you were talking about earlier today. Cynic. 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 Yeah, cynical. They were being very cynical in their worship. Um, and God's like, that's bad. Um, <coughs> and so when God gives the commandments in the Old Testament to demand sacrifice, he wants the very best of the best. The lamb without blemish. Right? That's the words that we, that we, we stick to. So like Passover, um, when the Israelites had to sacrifice the Passover lamb way back actually in Egypt for the first Passover. Right? They had to take a lamb under a year old, a male lamb, perfect, without spot, without blemish, no broken bones, healthy, good condition, like the one you would take to the state fair, that lamb. Um, and that's what they were supposed to offer as a sacrifice to God. Um, and, and what you're saying here is, um, verse 7, by offering polluted food upon my altar, you say, how have you done that? 
verse 8, when you offer these that are lame or sick, is that not evil? God says, I demand the very best from you, and they're giving them the exact opposite, the very worst, the stuff that they couldn't even sell in the marketplace. This is the leftovers, this is what nobody wants. You don't want to go to a, a butcher and buy a diseased cow to eat. Right? And so, that's, and so they were like, okay, well, I've got this diseased lamb. Nobody wants to eat it, so I might as well just give it to God. That's like a slap in the face. What's that? That's like a slap in the face. Yeah, and that's what God's angry at in this passage. He's like, how dare you pollute my altar with this? Try doing that to, to just, just the governor. Right? So the Persians rule over you. When you next time you pay tribute, give them it. Instead of giving it to me, give it to them. Give them the diseased cows, the diseased goats, the diseased whatever it is. The broken, the broken bones, the super skinny ones, these worthless animals. You give it to your governor and see how he responds. And he's like, then why won't you, why am I not even, you know, accredited that? He even says here, um, verse 10, Oh, even that there was somebody among you who had just shut the door, right? It would be better if you didn't offer anything than to offer these horrible animals. Like if there's, there's not even a priest of such um, integrity as to deny these animals to be sacrificed. You're doing it. You're not even closing the door to the temple. It's, you're, you're just allowing it in. Um, and I will not accept this offering. And so those are very important words. Um, there's a lot of different offerings and sacrifices made in the, the Old Testament sacrificial system for all kinds of things from like uh, giving up a sacrifice for a blessing it's like you go, you're driving home one day, uh, you, you pull up in your driveway, you get out the door, there's a lottery ticket on the ground, it blew in through the wind, you pick it up, it's a winning ticket, unexpected blessing. And in the sacrificial system, you would go and give some of that money to God. Right? Blessing, yeah, that kind of thing. Or um, let's say that somebody you know died, you had a funeral, um, and then you touched a dead body, and you had all this you know, uncleanness on you, you would go and offer a sacrifice to become clean again having experienced death. Or big ones, like they have atonement, where you offer up an animal in exchange for yourself. So like a cow, or a goat, or a pigeon, depending on how much wealth you had. Um, this is what you're going to offer a dove um, uh, in exchange for your life. Or on Passover, where you offer up a sheep in exchange for your life. God's like, I'm not accepting those. That's a big deal. This is God saying, you are in your sins. And so you repent of this. Okay? Um, any questions so far? Cool. Going on then, verse 11, from the rising of the sun to its setting. Um, this is just how the Bible says the whole world. It's just a poetic way that God talks about. From east to west, the four corners of the earth, however you want to say it. From the rising of the sun, well, that's the east. To <laughs> its setting, that's the west. This is just everywhere God's name is great. And everywhere people will offer sacrifices, pure offerings, like us. That's what we do. He's talking about us here. This is the prediction for when belief in God covers the whole world like it does now. We're all offering our sacrifices to God. Uh, for my name will be great among the nations which it currently is. But you, you profane it when you say the Lord's table is polluted and the truth that is my food is despised. Again, this is that, you know, I'm giving God whatever's left over that I can't sell the story for a couple bucks. Like, okay, I might as well, I got this left over, I'm going to give it to God. Right? And then you say, what weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence, or is lame, or is sick, and this is you bring as your offering. Will I accept it? The answer being no. This isn't how you treat God. In fact, cursed are you. Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and sacrifices and new blemish. God's like, I've even given you the right things, right? I'm in charge of what animals are born. I decide their, their gender and what they look like. That's part of my role as God. I've given you the sacrifices that I want. I gave you the unblemished male, and you give it to somebody else. And you are cheating me out of what is mine. Um, For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. And then God also here very explicitly calls himself the God of armies. Once again, to remind Israel of who he is. That this isn't just a, this isn't gentle Jesus, meek and mild, right? This is the God of armies um, demanding what's his. Cool. Any questions about this? Okay. 
modern application then, how would this apply to our lives? We don't have to sacrifice animals. No, Jesus has come. He is uh, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Yes. What does this have to do with us? I think like more in a literal sense is when we tithe. Yeah. That we give our first fruits and not what's left over. Yeah, if you want to specifically address tithing in this one. We're going to know that a bit later on. Yeah. Or in the not so literal sense, like um, how you are as a, as a person, if you want to do the right things, um, you know, if you have, should I take care of this person or I'm just going to go off and do my own thing? Mm -hmm. Kind of, um, you know, what will God want you to do? Yeah. Kind of thing. The oldest man, what would Jesus do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on, it's on the right track. Now, this is more has to do with the attitudes. Um, what is your attitude of giving to God? Is it with the, the, the flippantness of, well, that's what I got left over. No, that's fine, I guess. You know, I can't eat it, so I might as well give it to God. Or are you giving to God out of joy? Like, thank you, God. The fact that you are God, that you're taking care of me, and that I have salvation from you. Please receive my offering, because I want to give it to you for all the blessings that you've given to me. And so a, a, a stronger application, um, although the things you're saying are very true, is the attitude to which we do it. Yes, we give to God out of duty, because God you know, says you should do those things, um, but also with the spirit of thankfulness, um, and the spirit of trust, would be another word. That we trust that God has given us more than we need, like that God has given us the things that he wants us to give back to him, as he says here with the male sheep, right? I've given it to you. Don't give it to somebody else. This is mine. And so we trust that God has given us things that he wants us to give back to him. Um, and it is, this is, uh, yeah, the spirit of trust, I guess, or the spirit of joy in our in our giving. A lot the same of what you talked about this morning with the... The sermon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, heard it, I heard it said once, and I think we've talked about it in Bible study before. If you want to love God more, give more of your stuff away. It's like the moral of the story of the rich young man. But then that's such a two-sided thing because you know, <laughs> yeah, we are again throwing stuff out there. That's not what it, it's not what we do for him. It's what he did for us. Right, right. It is. Um, and so, um, we're going to shift the metaphor of the ten talents because I like that one less. I like that one more. <laughs> um, it, help, it helps describe this. So in the parable of the ten talents, God has given everybody blessings. Some he's given one, one he gave five, one he gave ten. Um, the person who had ten was expected to return ten. The person who had five was expected to return five. The person who had one was expected to return one. Right? We live in the world of we're the ten. And so while we do have this tremendous amount of blessings that God's given to us, that comes with it a tremendous burden of using them. And in our particular context, and this was the whole sermon today, um, the danger is that having stuff takes our focus away from God. And we need to be focused on God rather than on stuff. Something that I struggle with, and I'm a pastor, and we talked about my sin of Kavadi a lot, and uh, bring that up. Uh, you know, we talk about other other such things, and it is it is a constant battle that we have to that we have to fight with. And so, at Malachi here, God's talking to us through the prophet Malachi is that our stuff, um, we should live our lives where we try to keep, um, where we see everything as ours. Um, we need to see that things are God's. Um, and when we have the more stuff we have, the more tempted we are to think that it's mine, when in fact that it's God's. Um, and we need to be, be mindful of this. And this is, it's not easy. Um, and that's what the point of the message of the Gospel from Mark was today. It's not an easy thing, um, but it is a necessary, necessary thing. And then in Hebrews, um, it says to exhort one another, lest you become hard hearted. Um, and that was very similar thought in this process is, yep, it's something that we have to talk about uh, because we don't want to become more hearted. We don't want to to lose faith in God because God has blessed us too much. That would be the ultimate the ultimate badness. And so that saying, you know, if you want to love God more, give more of your stuff away, it's not because it's going to save you anymore. 
Um, but the less stuff you have, the more dependent you are upon Jesus, or the more you see Jesus as the one who's who gives you things. And that's a stuff you can take with things for granted. Yeah, yeah. Oh, am I going to tell you to go and give everything you have to the poor? I'm not going to do that. That's not that's not what Jesus' point was in saying that. Um, his point in saying that was the last phrase. Then follow me. Right. That's that's the important part. Um, the disciples had things. Like they didn't. The, the twelve disciples didn't sell everything they had and gave to the poor. Right. Peter had a house. Jesus stayed there in Peter's house. Somebody had a boat. Jesus fell asleep in that boat. So it's not like they didn't have possessions. Uh, but the important thing was the following Jesus part. If a man was trying to not follow Jesus, Jesus is like, your stuff's getting in the way of following me. We don't want stuff to be in the way of following Jesus. Same thing here. There are great possessions that God's given them um, as preventing them from worshiping God properly. They worshiped differently in the Old Testament. The Old Covenant, it worked differently. And so, but it was a similar problem. They had too many nice things that they didn't want to to give it up, and so they weren't worshiping God right. And that's what he's, he's getting at here. If you have specific questions about how much you personally should be giving to God, I can help you with that. We can talk about it. Um, it's a fun conversation. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a hard one. Because we're not under the, uh, the Old Testament code of everybody must give exactly 10%, even counting out your dill seeds. <laughs> but we could, we could talk about what, what that would be at a different time. Hmm. Well, you opened the door. <laughs> yep, and I'm going to close it. Chapter 2. <laughs> Spoiler. So, tithing then. Um, we use the phrase, there's, there's seven phrases that we like to use because that one's a holy number and somebody clever came up with them. Uh, we call it stewardship, right? Um, and I always think of Lord of the Rings because I'm a nerd. Uh, but a steward is somebody who manages something for somebody else. Right. So let's say that your family has property in North Dakota. And you don't live in North Dakota because you live you know, in Wisconsin. Speaking of my grandmother. Um, so my grandmother has the old family homestead that her whatever grandparent gave and they still have it. My grandma lives in Milwaukee. She has nothing to do with it. It's being run by the steward, the steward of the, of the estate who manages it. Um, same thing with us. We're God's stewards. Genesis chapter 1, we're made in God's image. Jesus talks about stewardship. And so we run the things in place of God. Can't see God, can see us. We run the, this, the way that we think God would want us to. Okay. I don't think we're doing such a bang up job. First step is, is we're God's stewards. Second step, God's stewards are God's <laughs> stewards. Right? So first, first step is seeing yourself as a steward. Second step is seeing that you're God's stewards. Not just any steward, but you're God's, which means you belong to God. And so in spite of your stewardship, good managing or bad managing, that's not what makes you saved. What makes you saved is Jesus. So we always have to keep that in focus, lest we try to be like the Pharisees who count the seeds out, so that way they like, I am perfect, I can get to heaven. No, 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 you're not perfect. That's not how it works. We always have to keep that in mind, because it's a very real danger of trying to justify your own actions and your own spending and your own whatever it is to, to be saved. And then uh, the next one is give till it feels good. Not give till it hurts. Don't give till it hurts. <laughs> give till it feels good. Because um, giving in the New Testament isn't about a 10% tithe. It's about returning thanks for the blessings that God has given to you. Right, so we see in Acts chapter 2 when everybody goes and sells everything they have, right? And then they give it to because they're super, super excited. This is, I'm so overjoyed with everything God's given me, I'm gonna go and give stuff to the church. Which is the intention, um, that God has given us blessings, that we rejoice in the blessings that God has given us, and then from the abundance of blessings we return to God, whatever it is. The tithe, the word tithe literally means 10%. You can almost see the word 10th in it, in tithe. And that's fine, that's a healthy place to start. If you don't know what else to do, 
great. But there's more delights than just money and more ways to give back to God than just you know 10% of your paycheck. It can be in volunteering at the church. It can be to other, other avenues that God does. The God does work through through missionaries or with other other ministries, the church crisis, pregnancy centers, that kind of thing. Are also taking care of your neighbor. Yep, yep, taking care of your neighbor. That kind of stuff is all also super important and, and a part of this. Oh, move to the side of another. It's only three. There's four more. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. We'll look it up later. But for our lives, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, when we give to God, we do so out of a joyous, a joy of God's given to us so much, so I'm going to give back to him out of the abundance that I've been given. Um, and there is no set, it has to be this amount. I do encourage, everybody encourages the 10%, because that's just a, a good place to be. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's good. We'll talk, we can talk about it more in a stewardship Bible study series if you want to do stewardship. We can talk about that. We can put it on the list after Job. <laughs> I think we had a sermon series on that at one time. Yep. yep. We'll probably do another one of those. Um, it's good to talk about. Usually we talk about stewardship around Thanksgiving. I don't know why, but it's just like that's the time the church talks about stewardship. Uh, whatever. Any questions? I feel like I'm rambling. Okay. Yeah, I'll look up the seven. I'll look up the seven points. Maybe I'll put them on Facebook or something. Whatever. Cool. Are you prepared to tackle chapter two? For the first section of chapter two, we've got about ten minutes left here for Bible study. Okay. So we'll just do these first nine verses. I'll I'll read them here. And now, O oh priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring, and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave it to him. It was a covenant of fear. And he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from that way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts, and so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways show partiality in your instruction. Mic drop. <laughs> yeah, God's not, God's not pleased. No. What's he upset about here? The priests should be the leaders and doing these things. They're, they're actually, I feel like he's holding them even to a higher standard that you should be correcting these yeah. other people too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you're not. Not. Yeah. Yep. It's pretty bad. He wants to put spread dung on their faces. Yeah, it's gross. Not something that I would want to have happen to me. <laughs> they should be the ones closing the doors. Yeah, they sh they're the ones who know better. They should be the ones who know how sacrifices are supposed to work and what's supposed to be offered, but they're not teaching the people. It's one thing if people don't know something. It's one thing if people know specifically you're supposed to do this and then they don't do it. It's another if they don't know they're supposed to do something and then they don't do it. The old saying goes, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and the priests though, they do. Um, so we have here that this, these, this, these key verses here starting in verse five. My covenant with him was one of life and peace and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear. He feared my name. He stood in awe of my name, and true instruction was on his mouth. The lips of the priest, verse 7, should guard knowledge. The people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. This is God saying, I had this, I had this system worked out, right, where I wanted to tell something to the people, so we have it in the Bible. 
The priest would take the Bible and read it and tell it to the people so they could learn. This is what God wants. This is how the system is supposed to work. It's a system of, of, of awe and fear and reverence. A system that ultimately brings life and peace. Life because you will have salvation in my name. And peace because I will be your God and you will be my people and I will protect you. And this whole system is supposed to run through this, this group called the priests. We're supposed to teach this to the people that they will know what they're supposed to do so we can have this, this healthy balance. But you're not doing it, oh priests. <laughs> um, you know, the, the dung on the faces thing. Now, it's not cleanness that you're presenting. It's something else. And that's, that's, that's what he's, he's getting at here. You have turned aside from my way. You are causing people to stumble by your instruction. Are they sinning? Yes, but you have the greater sin for allowing that to happen. Um, and so God is very, very harsh with the priests for allowing these sins to take place. Yeah. So, what does that have to do with our day and age? I think it's the same, but, you know, yeah. you're held at a higher standard, I think, just because you're supposed to be teaching that stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're like shepherd. Yeah. Gotta start throwing rocks at you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gotta start throwing rocks at you. <laughs> not, not at us, like, to the side of us, so we know to go yeah, in the yeah. direction. Um, so Martin Luther spends a lot of time talking about this passage. Um, Luther was very concerned with priests and pastors and what they were teaching. Um, you know, the whole Reformation was to correct false teaching. And so Luther does spend a great, great deal of time talking about what he calls lazy and faithless pastors uh, who don't actually do the work of, of, of pastoring. And he talks about this, and he takes this, this passage to mean sermons. Um, and he says, it's one thing to have your people go home and read the Bible. Right? Reading the Bible is good, and it's, and it's healthy, but if there's nobody there to tell you what it means, it, should, it can just kind of be words on the page. You have no idea what's going on. And so the priest is super important as the messenger of the Lord, as it says here in, in verse 7, uh, to explain what God means. Um, and so there is this extra responsibility that falls on pastors, that falls on priests, um, to teach people this is what God expects of you. Um, and that's a very, a very noble task, <laughs> I think is the word that he uses. Uh, kalu ergu in Greek. Again, if you want to sound smart, it's talking in that language. It's a noble task. Um, Can you learn? Yeah, what is the Latin? <laughs> Rabbi Voke of some kind. Uh, um, and so this is a this is a very a very real thing that we should do. But it also then applies to parents, uh, because parents are to instruct and teach their children. Um, in the same way that, uh, that God teaches us through his word, the pastors teach congregations, parents teach their kids. Um, to instruct them what's right and what's wrong, um, to have a proper understanding of the Lord. So, thank you. Is there gum in there or is it just a wrapper? It's for you, Dad. It's for me? Yeah. I can eat it? Yeah. Cool. So cool. Thank you, Dad. Cute. Yeah, so in our, in our lives then, um, we would say this is about, about true teaching. And we want to make sure that what the pastor teaches is true, what the Bible teaches is obviously true. And what we teach then to either our families or our friends should also be true too. We don't want to lead people astray. Um, Verse 6, we went to true instruction, was found in his mouth, and no wrong instruction was found in his lips. We want to be right in what we teach. We want to be um, accurate in what we teach. Um, so when we say, this is how you're saved, that's actually how you're saved. Um, we, want to be, we want to be true about these kinds of things. Okay. Any questions about this passage? All right, so I'm going to ask you a question then because we've got a couple minutes. Um, what would you do if you found someone teaching falsely, either a pastor or otherwise? If you were an Israelite, faithful Israelite living in this time period, under the prophet Malachi, 
um, and you, you saw these false things going on in the temple, what would be your thing to do? It's just a regular person. As a regular person, I guess if I thought you were misguiding us, I'd probably stop attending church. Sure. Um, because I'd rather not I'd rather not come at all than to be misled. You shut the door? I shut the door. <laughs> shut the door. Yeah. Slam that sucker. <laughs> or to, to confront someone that's that's hard. That's the hard part. Yeah. That's super hard. Yeah. Who likes confrontation? Literally Some nobody. People. <laughs> they pretend to, but nobody really does. No, but it, but it is, though. This is a responsibility that God has for all of us, is that if we see false teachings, like if somebody's like, yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to do this to be saved, probably correct them. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody on the street, right? So there's somebody out there with a giant cross by the side of a movie theater. It's not your responsibility to go and talk to him. Um, you mean like Jesus with the crazy cross? Yep. That's <laughs> exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. Um, but like if you're, like your, your children, or spouse or friend, something like that. It's like, you know, everybody's saved. It doesn't matter what you believe. Like, are they, though? Yes. It, do it does matter. These things are important. To be able to, to have those conversations um, is, an important, is an important part. Or to pass the buck to a pastor and be like, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what you're saying. It, it jives. That's the word. Jives is what we teach. Can we meet talk to me as pastor? Is it I'm talking about it? Something like that. Um, yeah. What's up? Just wanted to pray while. Why don't you go home then? I don't want to. It's okay. Well, we got a few minutes yet, so why don't you wait, wait outside of this room? You can wait in the, in the sanctuary. Okay. Thanks. Cool. I had a situation this week with someone that I worked with. Turn it off. Did you know? Yeah, okay. Yeah.